Language is the foundation of civilization. It is the glue that holds the people together. It is the first weapon drawn in a conflict. What do you have to say about that? Hey everyone, welcome to Care Fiction. I'm your host Subhankar and today we look at the science behind the science fiction of Arrival and also the short story by Ted Chiang which it was adapted from. I will assume that you have watched this groundbreaking science fiction movie. The story mainly focuses on our interaction with an alien species through the lens of a linguist. This linguistic approach to understanding the alien species by the acquisition of their language is grounded on a scientific theory and I'm here to help you explain and simplify that theory to you. I will do my best. So without further ado, let's get straight to it. This movie or the short story is based on the theory of linguistic relativity, better known as Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. As I go on to explain this, I would like to mention that this topic is still being debated and researched by experts. So all the supporting explanations that I am going to provide are empirical and expert based. And truth be told, this subject matter has really piqued my interest, and I hope it would have the same effect on you. Sapir Whorf hypothesis proposes that the structure of a language shapes the speaker's worldview or cognition. That is, it influences the way one thinks about reality. When we discuss language, we often factor in the role of culture. Culture and language are intertwined, so to speak. But certain theories, including this, also brings cognition into the mix, thus making the entire system nebulous. For the sake of simplicity, we are going to look into language and cognition only. But first, let's consume some history. The year is 1820, and a Prussian linguist named Wilhelm von Humboldt declared this. Proposing the view that language is the fabric of thought, he also argued that some Indo-European languages were the most perfect languages and that accordingly this explained the dominance of their speakers over the speakers of less perfect languages. It was a radical idea at that time, but with the passage of time, particularly in the modern era, it was heavily criticized and strongly rebuffed. Later, Franz Boas and his student Edward Sapir worked on to espouse this viewpoint of Humboldt and it was further advocated by Benjamin Lee Worf, whose mentor was Edward Sapir for a brief time. And thus we arrive at the current principle. The sapir worf hypothesis can be divided into two versions. The strong version and the weak version. The strong version says that language determines thought and that language limits and determines cognitive capabilities. That is one's thoughts are bound and restrained by one's language. The key word here is determine. The weak version says that language only somewhat influences our thoughts and behavior. The key word here is influence. To understand the true nature of the sapir whorf hypothesis and how it posits itself in expounding the scientific standpoint depicted in the movie, I will take you through a series of empirical findings. Believe me, you will find this fascinating. Whorf's most famous argument of his theory was the difference in the concept of time evident in the Hopi language. The Hopi are a Native American tribe who primarily live on the Hopi reservation in northeastern Arizona. Worf claimed that Hopi had no lexical units, that is words, or grammatical forms that refer directly to what we call time. For instance, as we have days, weeks, months to describe the linear, smooth flow of time, they view the passage of time as something like there is no yesterday, today, or tomorrow. So, in a manner of speaking, tomorrow is today again. Worf based his interpretation of the Hopi time on Einstein's theory of relativity. The strong version has largely been refuted by a large number of experts, criticizing on many aspects. Firstly, Benjamin Worf could never provide an empirical proof on his research of the Hopi language. Secondly, the question of translatability. If this version is true, then how could a work, like a work of literature, be translated from one language to another? The weak version, on the other hand, have intrigued experts and based on countless experiments and research, some do claim that this version holds true to certain extent. So the weak version is generally agreed upon by many experts. There are examples that lend some support to this version. Researchers have been studying the Cook Tyore people native to the settlement of Pampara in Queensland, Australia. 
When they performed directional based studies along with English speakers, they found out that English speakers have a relative or egocentric sense of expressing directions that is left or right or back or ahead. While the Gupta era speakers have a very different way of expressing space, they use cardinal or absolute terms to express the same. Thus it is completely normal in their language to say, can you move your north northeast leg? Thus the speakers of Gupta era are extremely well oriented and hence show a correspondingly greater skill in navigational ability than speakers of languages like English. And they always know the exact direction that they are facing. When experiments were performed to study the expression of some temporal or time-based progression, the Kupta array also responded differently. Let's say you were given some activities based on the temporal progression. So you have an unpeeled banana, then you have a peeled banana, a peeled banana half-eaten, and a full-eaten banana. So for an English speaker, when asked to denote or to express this temporal progression, it would be something like this, going from left to right. While in the case of an Hebrew speaker, it could be something like from right to left. But however, in the case of the Kuktairi people, no matter their orientation, it always goes from east to west. Another interesting research is that of color terminology. Some languages and their corresponding communities have only two ways of expressing colors, dark or light. While on the other hand, some have numerous distinct terms. For instance, we say dark blue or light blue to denote different shades of the hue blue. But in the Russian language, Goluboy means light blue and Sini means dark blue. Two different names for two different hues. Also the Tarahumara speakers, a uto aztecan language of northern Mexico, do not have separate words to differentiate between green and blue. Tarahumara has one word, Siona, which means green or blue. And again, I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Let us look at another example. Imagine it rained yesterday. So you as an English speaker would describe that as it rained last night. But in Turkish, there are two past tenses. One to report direct experience known in Turkish as Gorlan Geshmis Zaman. And the other is heard indirect or inferential called as Duyulan Geshmis Zaman. So you could not just simply say it rained last night in Turkish. I'm definitely mispronouncing it. So if there are any Turkish speakers out there, so please correct me or expand on this. So as you can see, there are ways to express your thoughts, somewhat encoded in the language one speaks. But it's not a different thought or there is no any difference in reality. So we cannot say in terms of cognitive abilities that one language is superior than the other. The movie is based on the strong version of the hypothesis. As we have seen, this cannot be held true for human languages, but the movie deals with an alien language. And why does it seem to fit right? Well, that's because we are talking about aliens and we haven't interacted with them yet in the real world. Or have we? Thus going by the strong version, when Dr. Banks starts acquiring the language, specifically understanding the written language, also known as Haptapod B, and decodes into several units, we come to know that she hadn't just acquired it, but she also gained new cognitive abilities. Abilities which rewired her concept of time. Rather than viewing linearly, she could perceive the circular nature of time. She can connect the present and the future. So you can see the strong version of the hypothesis holds crown as she acquired a new way to perceive the reality. One which is completely different from the rest of the humans. So that is the pure wolf hypothesis, the scientific theory behind the movie. I know it is not as conclusive, but the empirical studies thus evokes some curiosity. I hope that I could simplify it for you and if you have any thoughts on this, please mention them in the comments. So thank you for watching this video and you know the drill. Like, comment and subscribe. See you soon.